What are the logistics of using a Highline that's already set up? This is part six of a seven part video series that corresponds to the textbook on slackline.com on how to use a Highline that's already rigged. There's a lot of things that go into how to use one. We save the best part for last, the part you're probably assuming the videos would be about, and we covered etiquette, safety, prep, and gear and all that already in the previous videos. Now we're gonna talk about logistics. And if you already know how to Highline, please scan through the material so you know that you like it, and then please share this with some new Highliners so they can be more prepared when they get on your Highlines the first time. This is my new studio and lab, and in these videos you'll see my old studio and my old house because these were made a little while ago when I was there. And instead of having it one behind a paywall, everything's free on slackline.com now, and two, instead of 80, Little tiny videos kind of tucked away, unlisted on another channel. We're putting them squished into these seven videos and putting them here on the main channel. Now below, you can see on the timeline that these are broken up into chapters and in the description below. So you can skip to what you want to see, or if you're new, watch it through its entirety. Please leave in the comments below what you think could be changed, and we can make an eighth video after everybody leaves their comments and make a supplement to complete A to Z, everyone's thoughts on these seven videos. I hope you enjoy it and uh, let us know what you think. How do you tie a figure eight? Well, let me show you. Uh, basically, instead of an overhand knot, that is an overhand knot, is you go around one more time and you go like so, and you're creating this eight shape, but on your harness. And you can't attach this to your harness, so you have to do half of it, put it through your harness, and then do the other half. I like to twist that behind itself, go around and come towards myself. If I do that, it's orientated pretty nicely. If I go in the same direction, so this is on top, and I'm going around and then over, sometimes it can get a little twisted. But it's not the end of the world. Nothing gets stronger or weaker because of it. You just want it to be uh, dressed nicely. Uh, as far as knowing how far it is to go out, I go about like that, and I know it's where I want it. This is my personal anchor. Always have that on if you are sitting near a cliff edge. Anyways, you don't want to go down your harness to tie in your figure eight. You want to go up underneath. Now I have to manage where my personal anchor is and go decide if I want to go up or under. I think this will be fine because when I'm done, I can move this around where I need to. You don't want to do this here. You want to pull this all the way towards your harness before you begin. Then you're going to trace the figure eight, starting with, these are like train tracks, you wanna keep them parallel. So you pull that all the way tight, this goes around, so you go around. This goes down, so you go down, pull tight. This goes around, so you go around, and this goes up, so you go up. And it creates that exact same shape that we had earlier, and it's close, it's within one fist, of my harness. How do you finish your figure eight? Many times you will go underneath or you go down and then back up and it creates this back up. That's not entirely necessary. I've never seen a figure eight come undone, but it is nice to finish your knot. So what I do is I do add this back up, but what I do instead, let me show you what a Yosemite finish is is a Yosemite finish, and we are in Yosemite right now, is you go behind that and you trace it one last time. Sometimes you don't pull that tight if you're climbing, so you can just pull it out later, making it easier to untie. However, if you're highlining, you want your stuff tight. You don't want your fingers stuck in this. And what I've learned with these 12 foot long threaded leashes is that I like to do the traditional finish off here get that as, as close as possible to my eight. 
and then take that tail and then do the finish, Yosemite finish. And it looks a little funky right there, but what happens is this ends up getting to be all really tight and there's nowhere for my fingers to get stuck. And when I'm done, I just pull out this one tail, which is usually pretty easy, and then everything else is easier to untie when after I'm done massaging it. But if you can do this, let's see if I go this way, and then go up, that actually sits nicer. And then I go through that bottom hole, not up here, whatever seems to flow naturally here. Now, if somebody is checking you not, you will want to explain to them what you did because this can look messy. The other reason I do this every time is because if I have this exact amount of tail after doing this exact knot, I know my leash is exactly the length I want it. Hey Ryan, can I get a buddy check? You bet, Nick. Gee, thanks. Because we buddy check. Now, I have put my personal anchor in, so I'm safe while I buddy check you. All right, when we buddy check, we are going to first check to make sure we start at the harness. This one's a double backed harness and it's double backed and it looks tight, tight enough. Then we check to make sure the rope is going through the correct parts, through the two points of the harness. That looks good. And how you check a figure eight, so you count the parallel lines, two, four, six, eight, ten. And what we need to do here is do a backup knot. And since we have so much tail, we'll just stick it in there so we don't get fingers stuck in anything. So now we're tied off. And then I also checked the ring. That is a barrel knot because the type of ring that it is. And this is great beta. If uh, you break tapes, it's nice to have tape while you're highlining out there and it doesn't affect your walking. You are good to go. You can unclip your personal anchor and have fun, buddy. Cool, thanks. So when you do segmented highlines, uh, your leash might get stuck on stuff. My leash actually just got stuck on a tape right there. And you want to be able to, so I can feel I'm on a sewing loop and I can step just slightly past all those soft shackles right there. And sometimes I can just grab this knot and jiggle it. And that's how you can bypass some of those splits. Now, if the split isn't very good, your leash can get stuck. Now, sometimes on backup lines or backups flipped over the mains, sometimes that can create enough of a problem that uh, you get your main leash stuck. So one thing you can do, I cockeye the back foot, I'll take this and I'll jiggle it. You don't want to like fight it and get too, uh, make it too tight because then it'll stay stuck. You go like this and you keep jiggling it and you just keep fighting it and you don't let it get to your head and you keep fixing it. And that is how you deal with snags on your leash when you're walking. So let's talk about some leash management. As you can see, the leash is between my legs and I like that if I were to whip. Uh, if you do put it on the side of your legs, which is becoming less and less rare, it's nice to put a little piece of Velcro or a small piece of tape. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> on your belay loop, on your uh, gear loop, on the side so it keeps it off to the side. But as soon as I sit down, let's see here. That's how you dismount precariously. Anyways, right now the leash, I'm sitting on my leash. It's pretty dang uncomfortable. So I want to get off of it. So I just scoot my leg back. Now, I personally don't like to have my leash behind me when I sit start, even though I'm not usually that worried about it in most situations. So if I want to change the location of my leash, I have to grab it, pull it tight up against my butt, grab the high line, scoot backwards. And now it's in front of me because I do like to have the leash ring and have this loop on this side. So when I lift up my leg, I am very comfortable chongo sit starting. Carefully lift up my leg over that. My first step has no loop right here. And I'll show that to you right now. If I wanted the leash behind me, you just grab it behind you and pull it behind you, okay? Um, 
I'll sit start with it right by my butt. I put my foot behind it. And now it's in front of my foot like I like. And right now I can see I can lift my leg up and the leash is not catching my foot. Yeah. Wow, sits. <laughs> it's really hard uphill. Anyways, my first step right here is usually the most precarious step. There's no loop. I can feel the loop touching the back of my left foot there, and then nothing on my right. And now it's behind me quite a bit, especially because I'm walking uphill. I drag, behind, drag it behind me. This is why you don't want a leash that's too short where you can't stand up all the way, but you also don't want a leash that's too long because you get these really long loops that you're trying to manage. And long leashes are only nice in the moment I'm in right now because it would drag pretty far behind me. But let's get up to here. You don't wanna fall basically where I'm at now. You don't wanna fall. So you just mount the line. That was a little bit smoother. I'm sitting on the leash again. So what I do is I grab it, slide, throw it over, and now it's loose. I got my whole loop here. Um, and then I don't need to put my hangover on. I'm just gonna scoot, scoot, get my feet on the wall. Whoever rigged this line really thought ahead and put a heater right there. It's really nice. My leash is not gonna hose me. And so I don't have my hangover on. And then I can just sit here and take a break from filming. So how do you fall off of a high line? You probably, unless you're a natural, you'll be doing a lot of falling. The idea is that you don't go feet first. Notice the leash is between my legs right now. And what you wanna do is not grab this, because your finger could get stuck, but when I fall, I get your hands out of the system. I usually like to put my head, hand on my hat because I did not use a hat leash for many years. I have one now. And uh, you don't want to get anything stuck in here. And you want to fall head first. Because if you fall feet first, then you're going to do a flipper whipper, especially if the leash is underneath your in between your legs. So let's do an instant replay of how that's supposed to go again. Now, if you're in exposure, it's nice to have your leash in between your legs because if I fall backwards, it won't twist me around. Now, I will throw my legs over my head, but that's why you don't grab right here. It actually twi uh, sprained my wrist one time. But anyways, if I fall, uh, it's really hard not to grab the leash. I try to grab up here. If it has any pigtails, any twists, and your finger gets stuck, or your hand, you can get hurt. So, but you can see that a simple, a simple somersault allows me to um, spin right out of it, and I only flip one time, rather than flipping multiple times if the leash were to wrap around me. Falling is very counterintuitive to what you do in the park when you're practicing, because you're always trying to go feet first in the park, whereas up high, you're always trying to go head first. So keep that in mind, get used to falling, and be willing to just embrace it when you go high lining. How do you catch a high line? Well, let's talk about whether or not you should first. If you're walking in a no fall zone, zones that you should not be falling in, because there's a rock at an angle or something you could hit, which is kind of one over there, you're gonna have to catch. Shouldn't be in those areas to begin with, but sometimes you will need to. Um, sometimes you catch out of reflex, that's actually a lot of what happens. Sometimes you feel like you're too tired to climb a leash again, so you try to catch. So, back in the day, I would only catch and never, never leash fall. So, you just, um, the thing that really hosed me when I was learning how to high line was I couldn't ever stand up straight. And standing up straight is, the key to doing this. So if I'm anticipating catching, I'm gonna be highlining like this, which is really freaking hard. <laughs> uh, this is what people look like if they're gonna catch. And then you go down and you have to get your hands on it 
and then you have to get your leg on it. Otherwise you fall like this and it's pretty stressful on your arms. Now, right now I'm on pink tube and pink tube is pretty stretchy. So it's not really a shock load to my system. But sometimes if you're on like a big line and you ninja catch, which is catching out a reflex one handed, you could hyperextend your arm. Rather than how I went down, I went down with my elbows kind of bent and I caught most of my weight from the back of my foot. Now back in the day, Justin Smeston and I would come out to this very line and see how many times we could fall before we were too tired to keep catching. And that's what we determined was a successful weekend because we really sucked. But our backups were really tight back in the day, so it was a lot harder. But we would catch like 100 times in one weekend before we gave up. So, ah, instant replay for you. Wah. See that? My foot got stuck in this. That would have sucked. That stuff doesn't happen when you fall head first. How do you turn around on a high line? If I don't want to go this direction anymore, it's kind of hard to turn around. Too many times I've seen people roll underneath, turn around, and sit up. That sounds exhausting. So, my hangover is still on, which is fine. I just have to be aware of that. What I do is I do this gymnastics thing. And then I scoot over just like that. It's pretty simple to turn around. Everything's still orientated well. I do want to do some leash management and make sure that my hangover and my leash are proper. I am going to walk so I don't need my hangover anymore. Um, and I'm all ready to go. That's how you turn around. How do you make line sliding more efficient? Uh, there's first gear and there's second gear. Second gear is with my dog bone I love so much. But what's really cool about my system here is all I have to do, clip it directly to my belay loop, clip it to the high line, rotate, make sure that it's proper before I sit on it. And now being up, uh, raising my body up, raising my center of gravity, and it's actually, don't put your arm here, you can get pinched. Uh, you can actually pull yourself up a lot easier. It takes a lot less energy to pull yourself up, and especially if you're in this position. You just go a lot further. So, if you're struggling, oh, keep your line slide straight. If you're struggling, going up or down, you can just put it directly on your blade loop, which is how most people do it anyways. It gives you more leverage for you to have more control going up and down. Let me show you how to line slide on steep high lines. Right now I'm sitting on top, my ring's behind me. Ideally, I would have the ring in front of me because if I am gonna go that direction, I don't want the rings on this side of my roller. I want the roller to be the first thing going that way. Clip, flip carefully. Now, everything's in order. This is not that steep compared to some lines but you don't want to be like fighting it this way. That's un very unnatural. You want your head to be facing towards the anchor, whichever anchor is closest to you. So as soon as I get to that side, I would turn around and start going the other way. So I slowly lower myself. You can probably hear this crinkling against the, the roller. It's a lot louder if it's on the other side. You just go like that. And if you are trying to go back towards the anchor, same thing, same direction. Um, sometimes I can do this, but it only gives me so much power. If I actually need to get up the steeper part, I turn around and I can do this kick thing and pull. And that helps me get up the steep stuff. How do you line slide past obstacles? Right now my backup has flipped over my main multiple times. What I could do is fix it, but that would eliminate my opportunity to teach. Um, what I do is you put your heel up, your phone's not in your pocket, and you lift your hangover over that, and you slide it over all that, and then you continue. Now, of course, I could just fix all this. Once my hangover is over all that, I can't spin the backup 
over the main anymore. Now, of course, with 50 meter segments, it's a lot easier to fix backups that are all flipped up over the mains. So now I have a smooth connection. But with segmented high lines becoming more popular, I have an enob split right here. Sometimes there's a secondary loop sewn underneath that you would have to pass as well. All of my connections are right here, including the sewn bar tacks. You don't want to line slide over those if you can help it. But I can't easily slide over all this stuff. I get stuck, which is another thing. You don't really want to be sliding fast because you could stop quickly and that could be bad. So what I do is again, throw my heel on top, stuck my hips and lift up over this. Now I have five millimeter soft shackles here. Um, sometimes people use six millimeter soft shackles because it actually gets a little bit more strength, not enough for me to want to deal with a bigger thing here. But if you do have a bigger thing, you, uh, you can't, because soft shackles crisscross right here. What you can do is take your, your hangover and slide over it sideways in order to, there we go. Don't want to slide over the threads. You just need to get your weight off the system to get everything passed. Now, if for some reason you're on top, you can just scoot past, take your hangover off, or just manually slide it over and push it in order to get past the spot. Depending if you're already sitting on top and you just want to, like I wouldn't want to sit start right on that side and then have to deal with getting my leash over this. So those are all the different ways you can bypass uh, obstacles on your high line. How do you rest if you're too tired to keep sliding? There are multiple ways to feel semi comfortable on here. Some rollers actually have this half moon shape rubber piece that you can put right there. Never used it. Um, they seem pretty cool. But one thing you can do is you can put your heel up here, flip this upside down and put the bottom side of the hangover here. Look, no hands. If I had it the other way, I'd be sliding right now. Now this only works up to a certain steepness before even this would start sliding. What do I do when I'm in that situation, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. I get on top. I don't really like how tight this is. Take that off. I'm gonna clip it back to my little dog bone here. And let's say I'm going to keep walking. I just want to rest. I don't want to hang underneath. I've climbed back up. What I like to do is put this right by my knot. It doesn't really squish anything here or my stomach. I already have so much going on with my harness. And I rest like this. This actually works really well on pretty steep lines. Um, what I can do is hold myself as well right here to keep myself from sliding down. I put this hand is very important to put right here. So it's putting instead of this on the line, it's putting the back of my hand on top of my armpit there. And that gives me a lot of comfort here. And then inside my thigh and hooking my foot on there gives me this, I don't have to balance at all. The thing is you don't want to have to be like fighting your balance. You want to truly feel like a sloth while you're hanging here. Those are two ways to just relax. If you are on a high line, if you're going to hang on the leash down below, there is a risk that you, will be spinning. That's not very relaxing. And you also have to hold yourself up, which is using your ab muscles. So hanging on the leash isn't always the most restful. This I find to be the most restful way of being on a high line. Okay, how do you move on a high line? Generally, walking across is easier. I see a lot of people trying to scoot like this or like this. Uh, I don't know, seems all weird. People put it right up their ass, you know? So the way to transfer on uh, scoot over along on the line is something you can practice in a park. Put your hand right behind you. You see how I lift straight up? Well, let's see if I got that. That's how you basically do it. You lift straight up and you push. This is how you can get on and off of the anchor that's steep as you sit on top and scooch to the very end. And then you can scoot back and you can see people do this really fast. And a, a real good trick for this is I put this uh, leg loop, the big, big fat part underneath my thigh is actually the part between my leg and the high line. So uh, 
I can scoot fast that way. I can drag my leg across. I can bend forward, scoot my hips up, and very little force is on my leg. It actually feels quite comfortable. I've also done it for years, and that part of my leg is used to it. Um, you wanna be careful if you switch sides, not to nut yourself, but to switch your uh, center of gravity. Put yourself up, I'm lifting my leg up to get that harness between my leg and the high line. Sometimes it's nice to switch legs if one leg goes to sleep. Put your hand behind you, then twist your body, then put your weight on the line, and then you scooch. If you get better, if you get better, if you get really good at line management, being underneath, being on top, all this stuff, you can practice so much of this in the park before you get the rare opportunity to come high lining, then you're going to not wear yourself out when you're actually trying to walk. Uh, this can wear people out a lot if they're doing shit like this. I have done that, but it's been like on a line this steep. So don't waste energy. Keep your stuff centered and just scooch like this. How do you get off a high line? Well, first of all, sure nice to have a little aider here, put your foot in. Um, whoever rigged this did a great job. But it, once you get to the anchor, with your line slide, you don't wanna try to hose yourself. Let me give you a good example. You're like, you try to get off, and you go to smell, and you just fucking get hosed. It's actually a lot of fun to watch people do that. The proper way is to prepare to get off the high line, which uh, I'm gonna redo all this. Okay, I'm still clipped in with my leash. My hangover is orientated super good enough. I take my personal anchor that I have on me and I unclip it or off around my body and I'm gonna clip it to something on there so I don't fall off backwards. Okay, um, there we go. Pull that tight. Now, I could, if you feel comfortable enough, unclip this, don't drop it, make sure it's secure to you, and then make sure you have enough slack in your leash. Now, I'm gonna get up on this side, but you don't wanna have your, let me show you what not to do. I see this all too often, is poor rope management. They just get in a hurry, they clip it like this, Watch me hose myself again. You go up like this, and the daisy is under this now. And that creates a real cluster. So, notice I've been clipping and clipping and all that. I'm still tight and safe. Always be clipped into something. Safe, this is loose, this can go up to here. There's no twist, my foot isn't caught in it. And then I can stand up, sit down, and I'm pretty, comfortable here. Um, I'm already tied in. Sometimes when I'm on that side, it's a little bit easier. I don't have to put my daisy on in order to get off. And I can now untie this safely, clip it off to my anchor here so it doesn't slide down to the middle, and step away from the cliff, then undo my daisy. Let me show you one more way to get from the high line onto the cliff. Is you mount closely to the cliff without hitting your head. And once you're in this position, uh, especially for steep lines, you push with one hand behind you, one hand in front of you, and you scooch, and you scooch, and you scooch. It's actually a lot easier to get on the cliff now. There's not a lot of places to put my feet without my aider. So I put my foot in there. The thing is you don't want to forget is taking your hangover off and I feel pretty comfortable, so I don't have to fiddle with my daisy right now, my personal anchor. I'm still tied in safely. I have enough slack. I'm gonna go like this. Step up carefully, step up carefully. Stay seating, sitting. Then, in order to untie, I clip in my personal anchor, then I can untie. So sometimes mounting the line is easier, sometimes staying underneath is easier when you're going from the high line to getting on the cliff. What are high line specific scenarios? 
that you will never experience slacklining. There are three things that can happen on a high line that is two or three hundred meters long or longer that you'll never experience in the park. One of them is called humping, and that is when the webbing goes back and forth, the energy actually travels the long ways and not like the park where it's like going like this, especially on the short tight ones. Sometimes on the really big lines, the really, really big lines, it'll hump several meters back and forth, which is super interesting. I have actually found that did not knock me off the first time I experienced it on a nylon 300 meter because I just kind of walked when it was moving me forward and held still and walked when it was moving me forward. So it's kind of like walking on the up bounce when you're lighter uh, versus on the down part, the lower part of a bounce. So you just kind of have to work with it. It exists. There's nothing you can really do about it. If you're on stretchy webbing, on semi-tight, on something that's pretty long. Now it actually can happen on two kilometer long high lines on low stretch webbing because it's two kilometers long. But you'd have to be on a pretty long stretchy webbing to really experience that when you go high lining. The second scenario is if you're in a consistently windy environment that you have side sag, that you're actually blown off to the side and you're, uh, can, the longer it is, the more to the side you can be. You can be a hundred meters to the side if it's three kilometers long. That was an interesting effect that they showed in the three kilometer long project in Norway. Now, what visually looks to be a big curve or even an S curve, depending how long it is, what you're walking is right in front of you and what is right in front of you is straight. It's just curved a little bit over a long distance. And you're not going to experience this if it's only 30 meters long, but it does happen on lines that are looser, which is what high lines, how high lines are rigged. So you're going to experience this on a high line possibly versus a slack line that's tight in the park. We'll never experience that. The third scenario is having the backup line doing all sorts of crazy things because you're not going to be used to having a backup line if you've only slack lined in the park. If it's windy and the wind is especially if it's blowing up can actually flutter your backup webbing above your main line. And depending on how the wind is going, it'll flop it over and if you whip, it jolts the webbing and everything flips over itself and you end up having to step on top of the backup sometimes because everything's just kind of flipped over each other. I prefer to have 50 meter segmented high lines. So it's a bunch of small pieces put together in order to make a long high line. And that kind of minimizes how much the backup gets wrapped around the main. Since it's only every 50 meters, it's reset at a crisscross connection point. However, you do have to deal with the backup being blowing up and sideways and wrapped around your stuff and getting used to stepping on it and maybe having it wrapped over your foot and learning how to fall head first, tucking your feet out so your foot doesn't get wrapped around it. And technically there is a fourth thing that can happen, but it's pretty rare is the wind is blowing so hard up. You really shouldn't be highlining if it's really, really, really windy, um, but it'll invert you. There's so much surface area on the longer webbings that it'll blow you up and you're actually higher than the anchor and you're walking up a hill and then down to the other side. But that's uh, barely happened to me once. I've only seen it a few times in pictures. So those are the different kind of things you're going to experience that are going to be entirely new if you've never been on a high line and only have been slacklining in the park. Let's talk about your head game when you're highlining. If you're up there for the first time, especially, you will be scared out of your mind. And if you're scared, what you tend to do physically is to lean over because you want to be closer to the high line and high lining like this is actually pretty difficult. You want to stand up straight, put your chest out, get your body weight over your feet directly. It's a lot easier to balance. As far as your head game goes, you want to keep thought positive thoughts in your mind and a can do attitude. As soon as you let that little thing in your mind that says, I don't know if I can get across, you might not be able to get across. As soon as a little wiggle happens, you're gonna go down. You're either gonna catch or fall. So you definitely wanna keep your mind in a good headspace, even though that can be difficult if you keep falling. Sometimes you might be in a weird spot on the slack line. You can just scoot past that and keep trying so you can have a good experience overall. So your next time, your brain says that you can do it 
and that you could probably send it the next time. As far as a mantra goes, something that I am constantly saying to keep my thoughts clean, pure, and focused is left foot, right foot. Left foot, right foot. Now, some people count. I don't think counting is living in the moment. Some people count down, some people count up. It has not worked for me because I'm so focused on getting to 100 or whatever number I'm supposedly going for that I am not living in the moment. Living in the moment for me is when I put my left foot in front of me, when it feels good, I say, literally, I literally say left foot because all of my weight is going to be on that left foot while I move my right foot over. And as soon as my right foot feels good, I say right foot. As soon as my body weight has shifted forward onto it and I feel good, I'm like right foot. And I'm like, oh, that's going to hold me. Just like if you got a great climbing hold, you're like your right hand has you, you can let go of your left hand. And that's kind of like the mantra that I do. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, until I get across. And as far as music goes, music can help or it can be distracting actually. And I now listen to Psytrance after hanging out with Freddie Kuna enough. And that pounding rave music, ironically, calms me down. But it's also consistent enough and a consistent enough beat that it doesn't have these big highs and big lows that change my mood. I tend to sync my walking with the slackline energy with my music energy. And if it's changing all the time and switching from some slow song to a fast song or has ups and downs, it can throw me off. Sometimes music is nice if there's a lot of distractions going on around you, especially at a festival. You can drown all that out and just focus on what you're doing. But if you're highlighting over a waterfall, you're not probably going to be able to hear your music. Sometimes it is nice to just listen to nature, and even if a friend or two is talking, it's not the end of the world. So you can decide whether or not you want to try to do music. Now overall, flow state is what you are kind of trying to achieve and you will probably achieve it if you highlight enough. True flow state is pretty amazing. It's not an adrenaline rush. We often tell people that we're explaining highlighting to that adrenaline is not the goal. If you have adrenaline, you're doing it wrong. You should not be that kind of scared, but super, super focused where everything's second nature and that you're thinking but not thinking. You can hear everything but hearing nothing, that you're entirely focused but entirely not focused. In the book of Slack that Kimberly Wiglin wrote, a large portion of it after the history section is all about flow state and the five chemicals that are released in your brain that happens when you reach this euphoric experience on a high line. The stuff that keeps us coming back weekend after weekend. I have literally been able to, and I guess in my mind, leave my body and watch myself highlining because I'm literally on what people are trying to achieve when they do drugs. I'm just high as hell, you know? So it can be such an, like, you don't get it every time you highline. I don't get it every time I highline because I'm not scared anymore about what I'm doing. And sometimes I get frustrated because of that, uh, because I'm not more successful. But if I'm truly enjoying my experience, living in the moment and trying to stay on the line and giving it every fight I've got, I can achieve flow state. And that is really the magic of why you're highlining. Now, where do you focus? It depends what kind of line I'm doing. If there's a lot of distractions going on in front of me. I'll tend to look down and to my right. Tends to, I have more favor. I'm a right, right-handed side kind of guy. So I'll look down to my right. Because sometimes if I look at the line and it's wiggling, I'm trying to correct what I see and not what I'm feeling. In a bigger line, they're two very different things. So looking at the line has not worked for me. Looking at the anchor, if it's bigger than 30, 40, 50 meters, it's actually not helpful for me to look at the anchor. Whereas sometimes in your slackline in the park, it is helpful. So now, ironically, when I slackline in the park, I just look down at the grass while I walk because I want to feel the line and not see the line. However, once I got past a certain point and you're on a 300 meter line, it's kind of hard. There's nothing to look at. And that was an obstacle I had to overcome when I got on bigger lines. So now so what I can do is make small bite-sized goals, which helps me from being overwhelmed on those big lines. Because I think to myself, it's like, damn, I'm gonna have to, if I successfully do this, take 30 minutes of not falling and walk across this thing. And I don't know if I can stay up that long in this amount of stress. Because the closer you get without falling, the more stress you get because you don't wanna fall. 
So what I end up doing is I look at the tapes in front of me, since the tapes are about five arm lengths away, or about, I don't know, six meters. And I look at the tape in front of me, or two tapes in front of me, and I just focus on those, and I know that I can walk six meters, no problem, every time. And I make these small goals, and I don't look too far in front of me, and I don't look too close straight down. Otherwise, it like can mind fuck you if you're looking straight down. I have found that to be kind of fun lately, but that is mostly to be more exciting, not help me highline. Looking at the tapes helps. Looking down to the right, looking out to oblivion and not trying to focus on anything. You just cross, you're not cross your eyes, but just like don't focus on anything and just literally try to feel what's going on underneath your feet. And something that's also fun that I've recently been trying is blindfold walking, which is pretty tricky but it also helps you completely live in the moment. So those are some physical and mental tricks and help you wrap your head around what's going on in here when you go highlining. Hey, thanks for watching, but please do not be an idiot and go highlining your first time without going with someone who knows what they're doing. This video series is just to prepare you and help you have the gear and make it so you can practice before you get that special opportunity to finally go highlighting. If you already highline, please share this with somebody you might take out so they can go through the whole video series so they're fully prepared to get on that line so you don't have to rescue them. It's better for the YouTube algorithm ecosystem for me to release these once a week. So we're gonna do that every Saturday until they are all out. So you don't have to wait until we do that. We're gonna put the unlisted video links in the description below. So you can just blow through all this, look at the textbook and move on with your life. This is a gift economy style of education. I believe it's more important to have this information free and available to everyone than for me to get 20 bucks but it's not free to make. So if you enjoyed the entire course and you read the textbook and you look at the Boltzian Bible and watch all of our episodes, spot us 20 bucks. It really helps, 100% goes back on the channel as you can see on our donation page on slackline.com. We're a very open book. And make sure you keep your eye out for the Highlining 102 course. We are gonna completely finish this and the Boltzian Bible 2021 version before we finish the Highlining Anchor course. But that's going to be, oh, it's a lot more exciting to make that than this series. So uh, we're pretty excited about what's coming. So make sure you hit that like button and uh, we'll see you at the next video. Cheers.